So it's now my great honor to introduce tonight's Faculty of Science Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. William Mitch, better known as Bill Mitch. Dr. Mitch is known to many of us in the field as Mr. Wetlands. He's the co-author with James Gosling of the standard reference textbook on wetlands, aptly named Wetlands. And as you can see, I'm a proud owner of the second edition of Wetlands. So for those of you who don't have your copy yet, uh, the, fifth the fifth edition is expected to come out this year. Dr. Mitch obtained his PhD in 1975 at, Uni at the University of Florida, where he worked with the famous ecologist Howard Thomas Odom, who did pioneering work in the quantitative analysis and description of ecosystems. Since 2012, Dr. Mitch has been the eminent scholar and director of the Everglades Wetland Research Park of Florida Gulf Coast University, where he also holds the Juliet Sproul Chair for Southwest Florida Habitat Restoration and Management. Dr. Mitch is also a professor emeritus of Environment and Natural Resources at the Ohio State University, where he taught for 26 years. At Ohio State University, he was the founding director of the Olentangy River Wetland Research Park. Dr. Mitch further holds a number of courtesy or honorary appointments, for instance, at the University of Florida, University of Notre Dame, Tartu University in Estonia, and Nanjing Forestry University in China. Among other things, Dr. Mitch's work focuses on wetland ecology and biogeochemistry, wetland restoration, ecological engineering, and ecosystem modeling. He has authored or co-authored over 600 publications, reports, extended abstracts, and books, including the famous textbook, Wetlands. He has advised over 70 graduate students, including 23 PhD students, many of whom now hold faculty positions at universities in the United States and around the world. In addition, Dr. Mitch is the editor-in-chief of the journal Ecological Engineering. In 2004, Four, Dr. Mitch, together with his Danish colleague Sven Jürgensen, received the Stockholm Water Prize from the hands of King Carl Gustav XVI of Sweden. The prize was awarded to Dr. Mitch and his colleague for his lifetime achievements in modeling, management, and conservation of lakes and wetlands. And as you can see behind me, he's also been awarded several other very important prizes. Tonight, Dr. Mitch will present his lecture entitled Phosphorus and nitrogen and carbon, oh my. The catchment and global roles of wetlands in mitigating these pollutants. And we're particularly grateful to Dr. Mitch for having agreed to leave warm Florida to come to Waterloo in February to celebrate World Wetlands Day, wetlands Day with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mitch. Okay, can you hear me with this microphone? You're okay? All right, well, thank you for the nice introduction. And yeah, I could have been in Florida on International Wetland Day, but you guys invited me first, so I said, I'm going to Canada. Uh, <laughs> but I spent 26 years in Ohio freezing my tail off every International Wetland Day. I remember that too. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about phosphorus and nitrogen and carbon, oh my, because uh, really when you start to think about it, uh, my career has spanned enough time with wetlands that I've dealt with all three of those major chemicals and how they relate to wetlands and how wetlands relate to them. So I thought I'd put a talk together that covered all three and that's more or less at least the last half of my career as well. Uh, before I do, I promised uh, Professor Jim Gosling, who was my co-author, I promised his family that I would dedicate this talk to him. Jim died two weeks ago. And it's very sad because our new textbook, the 2015 edition, was announced on Amazon.com yesterday. So it's very appropriate the book's coming out, but um, I feel very bad about the, that's the only picture we have of Mitch and Gosling, by the way. Um, and. Uh, so again, uh, our sympathy goes to his, him and his, to his family, and uh, I'm sure they'll pull through it. But uh, anyhow, uh, 
let's go on to carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Now, I put them in different order because this time I'm going to give them in the order in which they're important in biology, but then I'll come back to, I don't know, they're just going to be all intermixed in my talk. But first of all, it's very strange that here we are, these are the three most essential elements for life almost. You can't get any more important than those three. Maybe oxygen and hydrogen, but those are pretty darn important. And so why are we calling them pollutants? Something wrong here. Carbon is the essence of all living organism biomass when bonded with hydrogen and oxygen. And there's the very familiar photosynthetic or respiration, aerobic respiration equation that you all learned. Nitrogen, of course, you go back, it's required for amino acids and are the basis of protein, a very important uh, ingredient for plants and animals. Phosphorus, basic ingredient of the cell's ATP power structure. And even the ratio of these three is kind of a sacred thing to me. I learned this from Odom, the red field ratio. We all learned that. Uh, that's the big equation. The simple molecular ratio is 106 to 16 to 1. How many of you students have not heard that before? A couple. Memorize it. <laughs> It'll be on your, your thesis exam. No, it's a very important ratio. That's basically the ratio at which carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus are found in, originally in plankton, but more or less a nice ratio to remember of how they occur in life. And if you don't like molecular balance, then in terms of weight, it's about 40 to, 40 to 7 to 1 in terms of grams. Okay? That's why I put them in that order, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus on the top of the page. Well, let's talk about why, they're, why they become a problem. Well, carbon, essentially the big issue, of course, is the carbon dioxide that's been increasing in our atmosphere uh, uh, for quite some time, actually since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but and it probably went back to about 280, they think, in the middle of the uh, 19th century. But, uh, and by the way, we were talking, I heard, uh, I heard uh, Pat give a lecture and talk about long-term data sets. This is the most important data set on the planet. And I'm sure Charles Keeley, when he was doing it, probably had trouble getting funding for it, probably uh, fought with agencies that wanted to shut it down. So when you start talking about long-term data, and I'm a fan of long-term data sites, sometimes it can be absolutely priceless. Uh, nitrogen. This is surprises a lot of people when I show this graph, but nitrogen, the amount that is in our biological systems, all told, and this is a rough approximation, well, atmospheric CO2 is up about 30, 20, 35, 40 percent even now over what it used to be. Nitrogen in the biosphere has absolutely gone up a total of 100 percent. It's doubled. So it's more extraordinary actually than CO2, and a lot of people think we're missing the boat when we just emphasize the change we've done on our global system with carbon when we better start looking at all the nitrogen that we've uh, put in our system. This is a, a report uh, during it all that was done by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I was on the committee, oh my gosh, we, we met for a decade, I think. Uh, it was ca called the Nitrogen Committee. And we did this big mass report. It's an incredible compendium. Unfortunately, they didn't take a global view at all. They just did it for the United States. But nevertheless, it shows where all the ni reactive nitrogen is coming from. In a, and it's a big number, teragrams per year. Uh, and you can see that most of this is the, the Haber-Bosch uh, nitrogen fertilizer. That's the manufacturer fertilizer, basically. And then there's quite a bit more that's biologically nitrogen fixation from legumes, either naturally or, or artificially. And that makes up wh where all this nitrogen is coming from. It's an enormous amount of nitrogen coming into our biosphere on an annual basis. And we have to deal with it. We'll talk about that. And then both nitrogen and phosphorus have been known and have caused excessive damage to a lot of aquatic ecosystems around the world. Uh, this is a diagram that was put together by the World Resource Institute, but it's, you know, it misses a lot of the sites, for example. But the uh, enormous number of hypoxia, coastal pollution, and so on, 
due to excess of nutrients on this planet. Uh, it's something like uh, six or seven hundred, I think is the quote I had on there. And uh, more than 750 aquatic systems worldwide currently suffer from degraded ecosystem service due to urban and agricultural inputs of nutrients. So basically that's the big picture, the carbon, the nitrogen and phosphorus, and the problems we have. Now, I'm a wetland ecologist and we've been studying wetlands and ecosystem services is now the, quite the term that's used. And by the way, I have to give a, a great appreciation to my late co-author, Jim Gosling. Probably nobody in this room will remember this, but, in, uh, but it, became a it was a really neat paper when it came out in 1974. He wrote a booklet that came out of LSU. It was never a formal paper. It was just a booklet published by uh, Louisiana State University. And basically its title, I believe, was something like, what is a tidal salt marsh worth? And this was 1974, long before Bob Costanza did his uh, paper in 1997 and way before the uh, Ecosystem Millennium Assessment uh, came forward. So he was quite a pioneer in this idea that ecosystems have value. Well, these valuable surfaces, I hope you could read that, yeah. Water purification, these are the terms that the uh, Ecosystem Assessment uses water purification, flood regulation, storm protection, biodiversity, islands and corridors, climate regulation, parenthetically carbon sequestration, and locations for human relaxation and observation education. Well, the two that I'm going to be talking about as far as these ecosystem services, are, one would be in the category of water uh, purification, and the other would be in the category of climate regulation. Okay, so those are the ones that I'll be emphasizing. Well, I've got three sets of data to show you for the three elements, so let's start with phosphorus. And I'm gonna start with the Florida Everglades because phosphorus is a big, that's not the only one I'm gonna talk about. Don't worry, I'll come back to the Great Lakes. But restoring the Florida Everglades, there's a massive phosphorus issue there that I'll try to explain to you. Um, this, on the left, it shows, I haven't uh, put a marker on, on the left it shows uh, what the Florida Everglades used to look like. It's sort of a river of grass with the big lake that's down in South Florida called Lake Okeechobee spilling over its banks on a seasonal basis, creating this wide river that was called a river of grass by Marjorie Stone Douglas uh, in her very famous book. And it flows down to the sea. Well, it's all been messed up. Uh, plumbed, changed, dikes and dams and pumps and everything you can imagine to the point where we have a system more like the middle graph. And one of the things you immediately notice in this middle graph is the water is going left and right out of Lake Okeechobee instead of south. That is the crux of the issue down there. Everything else pales. Because if they want to restore the Florida Everglades, they're going to have to get the water to go south. I just went to an Everglades Coalition meeting less than a month ago in, in Florida. And that was the theme of their meeting. Get the water to go south. Okay? It's not that easy, and I'll show you why in a minute, especially with the phosphorus issue. So you can see it's very artificial drainage system, and very little gets down to this. And this is all that's left of the Everglades as far as a protected park. I mean, this is wetland-like, but it's all heavily managed. And that, on the right, represents conceptually what they thought 20 years ago when they asked for 20 billion U.S. dollars. Not million, 20 billion U.S. dollars is being spent down there. If you want to be a wetland ecologist, move to Florida. At least that used to be the case. I think they've spent it all now, but um, the basic idea and every graphic I ever saw for 20 years was, yes, we're eventually going to get it all moving south, and, they, and that diagram persists. But it isn't quite happening that way. Well, okay, if you'll allow me, this graphic then hones in. There's that Lake Okeechobee. You remember that? Well, what happened, and the trouble with that idea of this flowing south is two main reasons. After a couple floods, they decided to put a big levee on the south end of Lake Okeechobee that's uh, 20 or 30 meters tall. 
when you drive around Lake Okeechobee, you don't see Lake Okeechobee. You can't even see it. You see this big wall. It's called the Herbert Hoover Wall, by the way, or Herbert Hoover Dam. Um, and that was to protect the citizens and the farms and, and the farm animals and all that that were south of the, uh, south of the lake. And in the meantime, also, and I don't know why they did it this way, but, well, I know, it's because it's the product, most productive soil, they, they developed this Everglades agriculture area just south of Lake Okeechobee. That's where all our sugar comes from, from the United States. That's massive sugar farming and other crops, but mostly sugar. They use immense amounts of phosphorus fertilizer, and that's a problem. So the water in Lake Okeechobee is polluted to begin with. It goes through here and picks up even more phosphorus. And what was happening, that phosphorus was getting down into the edges of the Everglades into some of these water conservation areas. And the sawgrass community, it's a, a sawgrass caladium, was the, those communities were changing to typha, or do you say tifa in, in uh, Canada? I don't know. They say tifa in Europe. Um, cattail, typha. They were changing communities, and that alarmed everybody. And they said, wait a minute, we don't want uh, typha in, uh, in the Florida Everglades. That's not natural. And so that was the signal that something was very wrong, and it was excessive phosphorus. So at least uh, they recognized that's the big problem. And they built these, see these uh, in light green. Can you see them? All those light green areas. They built these wetlands. Now they call them STAs down there. And I've seen it in a couple peer reviewed papers. And I refuse to use that term except when I'm absolutely forced to. Because uh, I say, wait a minute, those are wetlands. No, 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 Professor Mitch, you don't understand. They're STAs. No, they're wetlands. And we have this ridiculous conversation. Their lawyers won't let them call them wetlands. That's what I finally found out. Lawyers won't let them call them wetlands because wetlands in the United States is a very legal phenomenon. So they have to call them STAs. But they're wetlands. Take my word. I'll show you a picture. Um, but they're, nevertheless, they're meant to take phosphorus out of the water. And they've created 23,000 hectares of these things. That's not a trivial amount of wetlands that they've... Now, of course, they used to be wetlands way back when. Then maybe they were sugar farms for 50 years. And now they're wetlands again, or something like that. But nevertheless, they've put back about 23,000 hectares of wetlands there. And this is what they look... Now, that looks like a wetland to you, right? If I showed that on a slide, and I'd say, is that an STA or a wetland? You'd probably say wetland, right? Well... And actually, this is very typical what they look like. Parts of them are emergent plants, and often it can be typha, even though they're trying to get rid of typha. That's a whole other story. And often they're what looks like open water, but they're actually in the open water, there's submerged aquatic vegetation. So it's not totally empty. There's, there's plants there. So, and these work. I, I, I am very pleased, if I'm allowed to be pleased, uh, with the data that they're getting from these sites where they're reducing the total phosphorus from, what, 120 to 240 range to about uh, 30 to, well, to 100 there for a while, but it's basically more recently, let's go to that, the last five years in that particular site, uh, the average inflow is 191 parts per billion. Now get used to parts per billion. Parts per billion of uh, phosphorus and the average outflow is 35, 82% reduction. That's outstanding. That is incredible. Not so fast, my friend. The federal government, the EPA, who's pushing the state to do even better, has decided, no, 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 no. We want 10. We want 10 parts per billion. Now, they will tell you, well, it's not 10, it's 13, but whatever. Come on, let's round it off. 10 parts per billion is what they were asked to, and it's still, they hold their feet to the, that's the state now, the state agency is the one that's doing it, hold their feet to the fire to try to achieve 10 parts per billion. And you can see it's getting down to 30, what's wrong with 30? And so, anyhow, we were involved in a study, I'm just going to briefly show that to you as sort of an example, to try to achieve 10. And it was a mesocosm study where we had 18 big tubs 
that are one meter by six meters in size. The water was added at a very gentle rate, but we were taking the water from the outflow of STA1W. So we were starting with 30, more or less. And we, this is what those mesocosms looked like. Some were emergent plants, some were submerged plants, and so on. I couldn't show you all 18 in one picture. Okay. And the 18 represented six different vegetation communities. So there were triplicates of all three communities. Well, in the very beginning, I didn't even, the, the data starts like way over here. And I'm not even going to show you the first two years because you'd be shocked. For the first two years, the outflow was greater than the inflow. And the district was thinking, boy, what did we waste our money on this study? And I said, simmer down. This is a mesocosmic study. Things will turn out OK. Well, as it turns out, they did turn out OK. And you can see about, and by the way, the red line following all those lines. See that red line going through there? That red line is the inflow. So about in our third year, 2013, most of the outflows started to decrease below the inflow. And one or this one, one treatment, which is very strange, it was the water lily nymphiae treatment. That's what we started with. It wasn't nymphiae after three years, but it was what we started with. Uh, creep below 10 for a couple samples in a row. And you thought, wow, Professor Mitch, where's your next graph? The grant ended. <laughs> now, it had been scheduled to end there. But we were so excited we were getting this data. And we said, let's continue it for another year. And we almost got a contract. It got canceled and so on. That's a whole other story I won't go into. But there was somebody that didn't want us to get 10. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Absolutely convinced. There's only one place that has more politics associated with wetlands that I know of in the world, and that's Louisiana. You can't touch Louisiana. But Florida comes in second for politics and wetlands all intermingled. And there was some reason they didn't want to see 10. That's my honest opinion. But see how we, we made it. So we published a paper anyhow that got him even madder, where we said, or we asked the question, protecting Florida wetlands with, with wetlands. I didn't say SDAs, you notice. Uh, can stormwater phosphorus be reduced to oligotrophic conditions? That's what this paper's all about, and it talks about all the data on this thing. And uh, that's become quite a big seller down in the state of Florida, not because they like it, it's almost because they, they don't want to hear it. But we got a very nice endorsement. You're all aware of the Sierra Club and how important they are. And uh, this came out a couple of weeks ago, in fact, January 11th. And let me read it to you for, if you can't, Ralph. For those of you who think I'm engaged in hyperbole as regards to my claim, that the SFWMD, that's the South Florida Water Management District, that's the big mega university, mega, sorry, uh, agency that manages water in South Florida. Systematically underdesigned the SDAs, you all know what an SDA is now, right? Wetlands. Uh, here's a hot off the press analysis by William Mitch, former Ohio State, and now Florida Gulf Coast University at all, who in a paper protecting blah, 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 concludes the following. And, and they, they really jumped on one of our conclusions. Achieving 10 part per million phosphorus concentrations consistently from created wetlands in the Florida Everglades remains problematic. We said it's a tough thing to do. But this research confirms that it may be possible with low loading rates, the right vegetation communities, and low nutrient soils. So we think it's possible. So there we are. We're in the middle of a sort of an exciting discussion going on there because they have no plans to, do, to build the amount of wetlands that we said. Now, we didn't say how many wetlands you here. But these people, the Sierra Club, did a calculation, and it matched what they want. They want 100,000 more, let me get this right, must be about 40,000 more hectares of wetlands. In other words, more than double what they have now to achieve this. So the Sierra Club knows the right answer. I know the right answer, but the district isn't going to do it. So you get to stand off of whether 10 is going to happen or not. All right. That's going on now. That's a big, big phosphorus issue. Here's another big phosphorus issue closer to home. Here's Western Lake Erie. Some of you have probably seen this graphic. It was published in 2013 from a 2011 uh, 
algal bloom, that's, that's an actual picture superimposed on a map. The lake was green, the western basin of the lake. And I remember that in 2011. And there's been a Lake Erie uh, Phosphorus Task Force. They even put phosphorus in their title, so they, they are not mix, messing around. That said, nutrient impairment continues to plague Lake Erie, impacting an $11.5 billion tourist industry. Big number. Well, I was involved in an editorial in Ohio last year. Actually, I went to a meeting about uh, last March, so less than a year ago, in Ohio, and I said, you know, I think we should restore the black swamp to save Lake Erie. And they said, what? But I'm a professor, I'm an endowed chair and all that, I can say whatever I want, right? But it was an idea that I've always had, and then I started looking into it, and it's more and more makes a lot of sense. So anyhow, the Water Environment Federation, which is a big, big organization, uh, much bigger than any of our ecological societies, decided, Professor Mitch, here, you can do a blog. And I had to say, what's a blog? So this is still there, but no, none of those engineers that belong to this have blogged along with me. What are we saying? Well, I'm just asking the question. I know wetlands work. I've experimented with them in Ohio for 30 years, and for Illinois, for other sites, and now a great deal in the Florida Everglades, trying to get down to 10 parts per billion. And they work. They can be made to work. And those 23,000 hectares that I told you about down in Florida, very large scale, they work. So this is what the black swamp used to look like. This is a sketch. For, I've had this sketch in my textbook since volume one, hoping that someday I'd be able to use it. <laughs> and sure enough, it just so happens that I don't have all the slides to show you, but I can make an argument. In fact, uh, Pat showed a diagram. Where is she? Pat, she's not here. Uh, she showed a diagram uh, before in the afternoon that showed that most of the agriculture, most of the intense agriculture is on the western edge of Lake Erie. Most of it on the American side, some in the Canadian side. But that's where all the phosphorus is coming from. And especially this river right here called the Maumee River that goes all the way over to Indiana, to Fort Wayne, Indiana. There's just immense amount of phosphorus. About 60 or to 70 percent of the budget for Lake Erie comes in that one basin. So I'm simply proposing, if anybody will listen, we should really put the black swamp back. Of course, the issues will be, well, you know, who's going to pay for it and all that. But that $11.5 billion number sticks in my head from that first slide. There should be some resources to be able to do this right. And I guarantee you, if we fix the whole half of that uh, black swamp, we would solve that problem. And I don't see any other solution to the problem on the horizon. People are talking about best management practices, this, that, and the other, and they're just not going to work. But that would work. OK, well, that's my contribution to the Great Lakes up here. And I hope somebody st it's, it starts to get some traction. I have to tell you, show you one more thing. And this is a little silly, but this is what we do in America. Uh, <laughs> there's an organization called the Everglades Foundation. And in September 22nd, just this last past September, they announced, and just big fanfare, they announced a grand challenge, a $10 million prize if you could basically take phosphorus out of the water. Newsflash, we already know how to do that. Uh, you can just send the check to me now. They, they were, and actually they said they're not going to give it for like seven years. <laughs> and they haven't come up with the rules yet either. They're still writing the rules. So they announced this thing, and everybody got all excited. And they said, well, well we got to write the rules first. But, they're ser but they, no, the important thing is they do have the 10 million. They have a donor that's given it to them. And they just don't know how they're going to give it to anybody. They but it'll happen. That's the Everglades Foundation is a very reputable organization, actually. They've done a lot to save the Florida Everglades. So, the grand challenge is there. It's all about phosphorus. And by the way, you know what they said? Oh, yeah, we want somebody that can clean up the Everglades, but can you go up to Ohio and fix that problem up there on Lake Erie, too? <laughs>
I think we're in the running. Um, so again, that's just something to sort of throw in the back hopper to remember. So that's sort of the phosphorus story. There's the phosphorus issue in Lake, or down in the Florida Everglades, where they say, yes, we don't want it. Yes, we do want 10 parts per billion, um, which is a very, by the way, that's the concentration of phosphorus in rainwater. That's rainwater quality. And then up on the Great Lakes, we don't probably need 10 parts per billion, but phosphorus is a gigantic issue, at least for the western basin of Lake Erie. And the solution is right in front of us, and sooner or later somebody's going to realize that. Okay, well let's talk about, let's switch over to nitrogen a little bit, because we worked on that a lot too. Creating, restore, it's, every one of these has about the same title, Creating and Restoring Wetlands for Reducing Nitrogen Pollution of Coastal Ecosystems. Now the story with nitrogen, now I was in Ohio for most of my career, we didn't, they didn't care about nitrogen in that state at all, because they said, oh, we're phosphorus limited, everything's phosphorus, phosphorus, until someone told them about the hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. And so for Ohio, at least, two-thirds of the state flows south to the Gulf of Mexico through the Ohio and the Mississippi. Here's a graphic of that watershed. We prefer to call it the Mom River Basin, Mississippi, Ohio, Missouri, to give credibility and credence to Ohio because that's where all the water comes from. Why it was named the Mississippi all the way up and down, I don't know, Marquette and Joliet just messed up when they got to that intersection. Uh, also they didn't want to go east because the English were out there. So whatever, there was this, the river really goes like this. So it should be called the Ohio down to New Orleans or call it the Mississippi up to Pittsburgh. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's a big river. It's 40, that's 40% 40 of the lower United States. It's a big, big area. And I have two things colored on this map. One is this Gulf of Mexico hypoxia, which I think you maybe have heard about. It's a dead, the press called it a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And the supposed source of that hypoxia is nitrogen. By all standards of understanding how coastal systems work, they are nitrogen limited, and so it's the nitrates, especially, that are coming off of the landscape up here. So this pink up here represents, and this was a few years ago, sort of the hot spot for nitrate concentrations or nitrate per square kilometer uh, in the Midwestern United States. So basically, it's been determined, here's the, here's the uh, effect and here's the cause, and they're separated by 1,000 kilometers. So that really got some traction. Now this hypoxia, Nancy Rabelais down in Louisiana, she spent her career measuring this and it, it varies in size. This is 2011, 12, and 13 and shows you how big it is. And by the way, the hypoxia is defined as where the oxygen in the water is two milligrams or less per liter. Two milligrams per liter or less in the, in the lower zone, in the hypolimnion. And so these are sort of snapshots that they take in June or July when they take a boat out there to measure it. You notice one in the middle year, it wasn't so large. Well, here's a graphic that shows everything that Nancy has measured since 1985. They've been going out. There's a couple things to note. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Our federal government and their infinite wisdom in about year 2000 decided after big studies that I would, many of us were involved on. And they decided in the year 2000, I don't have the arrow in the right location, that we shall have a hypoxic zone no larger than 5,000 square kilometers. They just decided that. Well, guess, look what? Actually, it was below 2,000 on, on 2,000, and they were probably patting themselves on the back for some reason, but it really hasn't achieved anything close to that. In fact, the last five-year average is about, uh, what, 13 or 14,000 square kilometers. So it hasn't been improved, and in fact, maybe you could even argue the trend is going the other way. One thing that really happened fast that people weren't expecting was everybody turning to ethanol, for example. So there's not a square meter in the Midwest that doesn't have corn growing in it now. So anyhow, we really haven't solved this problem. 
Uh, we told them what to do. This is, by the way, my experimental wetland that I left after many years at Ohio State University. We created that from scratch. And at that wetland, and by the way, we just published a special issue. I have one copy of it from 20 years of research at that place, looking at nutrients, carbon, <laughs> looking at those three things I just told you about. Carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, the, and how riparian wetlands can help. Well, we, these are diagrams where the error bars are not annual samples. The error bars are years. So we have 17 years of data on nitrogen budgets, for example, or something like that. I don't remember how many years. And it's a very strong, it's a very strong number with, uh, you know, what? retention of about almost 40 grams nitrogen per meter square per year. Those are the kind of numbers that we can go to the bank with. We can say, look, we can create a wetland to do that very reliably. So that's in the, one of the papers there. But what we did even a few years ago when we were asked to, well, how many wetlands would it take to so save the hypoxia, we did some models where we looked at a whole bunch of wetland sites some of them were the Olentangy wetlands, but there were a whole bunch of others throughout the Mississippi Basin, and looked at nitrogen inflow versus nitrogen retention. Okay, very simple model. From that type of calculation, and then calculating how much we had wanted to reduce the nitrogen going into the Gulf. And by the way, this is a diagram that has been repeated and repeated many times around. I see it all the time in people's talks now. They must be able to pirate your PowerPoints or something. But uh, basically, the idea is we called for, in our study, which was published somewhere, it's not given here, uh, published in Bioscience in 2001, that really what you need is a landscape with wetlands to intercept the tile, bottomland forest to intercept the groundwater flow, both of those to intercept nitrogen, and then in addition to that, better management of nutrients on the landscape. We don't buy it for a minute that agronomy is going to solve the problem. It just isn't going to happen. So we're saying you need both. And when asked, we said, well, we need about 2 million hectares of wetlands strategically placed in the Midwest to accomplish that. So it's just like this, we're a little further aligned. Maybe they put 0.02 million already. But uh, a little further along on this than we are on the Black Swamp. But again, it was a case of removing nitrogen. Now, one more thing I can tell you. You build a wetland, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. What if all of a sudden somebody says, we've got to take phosphorus out? Well, the wetland's already doing that. So if you come up with some sort of chemical reason and then somebody decides that something else is limited, you're in big trouble. So that's another reason why you have to look at these ecological solutions to ecological problems. Okay, so that's the nitrogen story. Carbon. This one's a little different. It's been my thesis for a long time that wetlands offer one of the best natural environments for the sequestration and the long-term storage of carbon. They are the best ecosystem on the planet for doing that. They may be the best system on the planet for doing that. With all the silly things I hear what people are doing with CO2, pumping it down into the, the earth and all sorts of crazy stuff. But they are also natural sources for greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And that balancing is something that we're still trying to do and figure out. So both of these processes are due to the same anaerobic conditions that you find in wetlands but there's not a cause and effect. You know, they both happen. You get carbon sequestration when it's anaerobic, you get methane generation especially when they're anaerobic. Well, I'm gonna show you two carbon budgets, one that was published in our last book. So you're gonna to have to remember some of the numbers on this one to know how things have changed. This is the old carbon budget of wetlands that, that we featured in Mitch and Gosling, 2007. And one of the features of that that hasn't changed is the gigantic amount of carbon that's stored in, in what, this, this whole box here is wetlands. 
So obviously this graphic is emphasizing wetlands in the global scale. And by the way, the fluxes are in petagrams per year, and the pools are in petagrams. That's 10 to the 15th grams. Okay, so in all the wetlands of the world, there's anywhere between 450 and 700 petagrams of carbon stored. And I would say Canada, somebody, we were talking about this earlier, you, you have at least 30% of that here, probably. Does anybody know the number? Is that about right? So a lot of that's Canada. Originally, these numbers came from different sources. Uh, mostly, Evel Gorham had done a paper back in the 90s estimating and he just did it for peatlands, of how much carbon was being sequestered and how much was being lost globally. And he put 0 .08, 0 .08 peat burning and 0 .03 uh, burning draining going the other way, so a net of 0 .05 petagrams, okay? Can you remember that one? That's gonna change. Also, at that time, there were enough estimates that they could estimate methane generation. These are also in terms of carbon, not CH4. And it was estimated at the time that about 0.13 petagrams of carbon as CH4 coming from wetlands and another 0.07 almost, you know, from artificial wetlands that are called rice paddies. So 0.2 total. Also, I don't know if it, let me see if this circles. Yeah, it does. Also at the time, there was 6.3 petagrams per year coming from burning of fossil fuels, okay? So what this was saying, and the way we wrote in our book, wetlands have enormous storage of carbon, but the fluxes going in and out are, well, there's, the methane might be significant, but the fluxes going in and out otherwise were trivial. And that's basically all you could say from those data. In the meantime, Bloom et al. published been a lot of publications on methane, but I brought you this one to your attention. They suggested 227 teragrams. Now you've got to be careful with units here now, because now we're in teragrams, not petagrams. So it's, they're basically saying 0 0.227 petagrams of CH4, but you've got to convert it to, C, to carbon. So the number was very close to what I had several years earlier in, in our diagram, very close. But they were saying most of it was coming from the tropics. Now, nobody had thought about that before. So, I lost my other diagram. Oh, yeah. On average, methane emitted for wetlands is about 14% of the carbon sequestration for wetlands. That, that we determined from a whole bunch of numbers that we put on a graph. If you uh, if you have 100 units of carbon sequestration, you have 14 units of methane generation, okay? You gotta follow the math in this diagram, it's kind of goofy. That's a seven to one ratio, okay? But that's also a 19.5 to one as CO2 over CH4, because we have to put it in molecular sooner or later. Everybody, what, all you guys taking chemistry 101? You're okay so far? <laughs> Okay, the standard global warming potential used by the IPCC, by the way, it's changed since this diagram, uh, since I, sh I should have updated it, but let's take it for granted that it's still 25 to one. In other words, you need 25, you need 25 moles of CO2 uh, collected for every one mole of CH4 emitted. It's, it's, it's what I call the, the methane tax. You really have to do a lot of sequestration to take care of a little bit of. It can be concluded, 25 to 5 is what do you want, 19 to 1 is what you get. If, if we stopped here, we could conclude from the simple comparison, the world's wetlands are net sources of radiative forcing on climate, we all should go home. The wetlands are warming the planet already if you stopped here. Everybody see our logic? Any chemists in here want to challenge me? Because you know we're not stopping here. Uh, so what we did, and we published it, and I won't go into the details later, and it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion that has emerged from this little model we did. 
It's a very simple little model. We had a model, we, we simulated it, it was a first order differential equations. It only had two processes. You had the basically carbon sequestration as the net of these three processes, but we didn't single them out, so there was just carbon sequestration going in and methane coming out. But there's a very important process that a lot of people don't account for. The methane is not permanent in the atmosphere. It decays to CO2, and so we have that pathway. That's all we did. I'm not an atmospheric science, but I was actually running an atmospheric model. Two boxes. And the half-life is something like 7 to 12 years for methane. And it worked. And most of those wetlands, we had 21 wetlands, and they all came clean. That's the right term. Most within 100 years, and, and only a couple it took 300 years. The only ones that could not come clean, become good wetlands, were two Siberian peatlands that were already CO2 source. If you're already a CO2 source because the water level's been dropped or something's happened, I can't help it. That wetland is bad wetland. But as long as there's a CO2 sink, that will eventually trump methane. I guess that's what we were saying. Anyhow, it's all in that paper. So from that, we were able to take, we had 21 wetlands total. And, and, uh, and my criteria was the following, either I <laughs> or my lab measured it, and we had seven of those, or in a, there was a peer-reviewed paper that had both carbon sequestration and methane generation peer-reviewed published. And at that time, we could only find, of, the, of those two criteria, 21 total wetlands. And they were divided nicely into tropical, subtropical, temperate, and boreal peatlands. And these are the numbers that we came up with of net carbon retention, after you subtract the carbon and the methane, 194 for the tropical, surprisingly the highest number in temperate, that really surprised us, and the very low number, of course, in the boreals. And then you multiply those by the areas. Now the boreal region has 3.5 million square kilometers. Tropics are not far behind, about 2.9, and very few wetlands in the temperate zone. Multiply all those together, add them up, and you come up with 0.83 petagrams, folks. 10 to the 15th. It's a lot more than what we had in our diagram. So let's go back to the diagram and start all over. By the way, between the editions of the book, that went up from 6.3 to 10. So much for sustainability in our society, right? I was surprised how big that jumped. That's, that's a big, big jump. So it went up to 10. That stayed right on the numbers. All the numbers that we had to compare to the Bloom study and what we had previously, we nailed it. It's about, well, it's actually a little lower, but 0.17 petagrams of uh, going up as methane. But look at this, you take that 0.17, add that to that net number I just showed you, and we have one petagram of carbon going into the world's wetlands now. That's a nice whole number <laughs> to remember. That's easy. It wasn't even close to that before. So that's our challenge to the people who measure these things, who calculate them, we run models and so on. We, we're claiming that the lost wetland, the lost carbon, sorry, that a lot of people have been talking about really has gone into wetlands. A lot of that to the tropics, by the way. So we'll remain to be seen. You know, I mean, we're talking about that almost being, you know, 40% of what's going into the whole oceans of the world. I guess what I'm arguing is that wetlands are probably more important in a positive way on sequestering carbon on the, in the atmosphere than we ever knew, because right now the only way that the IPCC looks at wetlands is that they're bad, that they're creating methane. And I've been at many a meeting where we'll be talking about creating a wetland, and somebody in the back of the room who knows enough to be dangerous will say, oh, I know wetlands make mosquitoes, but I heard they make wet methane. And everybody murmurs, bang, wetland's dead. That's, that happens all the time, and it shouldn't happen, because I think it's, it's just wrong to take those assumptions. Anyhow, 
what am I going back to the Florida Everglades with carbon? Well, I wanted to show you just in the end here a few things that we're doing with carbon. There's that uh, Florida Everglades picture you had before, but now I'm going to emphasize th three main communities, uh, two of which I'm going to show you some carbon numbers. There's the big cypress swamp on the western side of the Everglades, and there's the coastal mangroves that edge the trop the uh, the coastal systems on the southern edge of the Everglades. And we've been doing methane emissions. This is what we've been doing in my labs, both in Ohio and now in Florida for years. And we do it on the ground. We, we don't use eddy covariance towers at all. We compare them to them, but we don't use them. And then, of course, we take cores, uh, sediment cores, as a conservative way of estimating carbon sequestration. We don't even count what goes in the plants. That doesn't matter, that's temporary. We're talking about soil carbon sequestration. Well, I had a student that just finished doing a study in a beautiful place. You should put this place on your bucket list, by the way. Uh, Corkscrew Swamp is just a gorgeous cathedral. It's the wetland cathedral. And it's got all these communities, which made it nice and the student didn't have to travel around. This is the big cypress. I can't even get the whole thing in a picture. The trees are so big. Uh, but he was able to measure methane emissions. We published a paper on that. You can see all, methane's a really tough thing to measure. It's not normally distributed, it's tough. But this shows some of the comparisons of the rates for methane emissions. And he also went to these different plant communities and measured carbon sequestration. And you can see it ranges. Pine flatwoods is not really, a, that's sort of a terrestrial reference, but the wetlands were from anywhere from 40 to 100 grams carbon per meter square per year, which is very typical. The mangroves uh, of Florida, we, we looked at two tidal creeks, one that was a disturbed creek, one that was a reference creek. I'm not going to get into that very much. This, by the way, is my lab. Everglades Wetland Research Park is right there on the corner of the Naples Botanical Garden. We have beautiful access to Naples Bay. It's really a beautiful place. You can come down and visit. Um, so, we did some measurements there. This is hot off the press from one of my graduate students that just finished like a week ago. <laughs> and this will be sent off to a journal, of course. But in the meantime, this is carbon sequestration that we've measured in some of those uh, different communities that you get in the mangroves. You have basin, fringe, riverine, and so on. And you can see those numbers range anywhere from about 50 to 140 or so. So a little higher. So we take all those numbers from all those Florida sites and look at them, compare them. And what we noticed was the cypress swamps, the ones that say cypress are forested with cypress trees. They are swamps in the real sense of the word. Usually didn't have very much methane and had a fairly substantial carbon sequestration. That ratio of 98 to 2, so that's about 50 to 1. And even the ones called pond cypress is about 60 to, 60 to 2, so 30 to 1. So considerably more carbon taken out by the uh, sequestration than allowed by methane. Remember, I'm not, this is not a molecular ratio, and I'm not getting into that 25 thing. I'm just showing you that the numbers look pretty good. But look what happened in the mangroves, the, both the impact and reference. One of the cool things about mangroves, and why a lot of people get excited about those being major carbon sources is they don't have methane. Now, is there any really, really smart wetland scientist in here who knows why? <laughs> You're cheating. <laughs> what? I, I can't hear you, but... No, it's, it's, all, it's usually considered to be, it's all about the sulfates. There's so much sulfates in seawater that that one kicks in before the methane, methanogenesis does. And uh, so usually sulfate uh, reduction, the H2S, that's why these systems do smell, but they are not giving off methane. You heard it up here. Your professor knows that too. So really, um, and, and these zeros are, I sent my postdoc out to measure methane, and when I came back from the summer, uh, 
I said, how'd your research go? He said, oh, it went awful. I didn't get any numbers. There were zeros. And I told him at that time, here's a good lesson, zero is OK. <laughs> zero is OK, especially in methane emissions. So we think it's almost zero. We're doing some more tests just to check in another season. But nevertheless, and they have a very healthy amount of carbon sequestration. So I will continue to do these studies in Florida. Again, we're in the tropics, subtropics, where you've got this. But I see, especially for the mangrove carbon sequestration, that is getting a big head of steam now to the point, has anybody heard the term they use? Blue carbon. Doesn't that sound catchy? It's called blue carbon. <laughs> Google that term tonight. You will see a ton of literature. Uh, that's what they've determined that, that salt marshes, mangroves, and coastal systems on the ocean are sequestering blue carbon. And it's getting a lot of traction right now. We're still kind of stuck in the mire, if I can use a, a term with the freshwater system, but in the coastal systems, they're becoming very important. OK, my conclusions very quickly. Wetlands can be designed to remove significant amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus from agriculture and storm runoff. Concentrations on the order of 30 parts per billion, I'm being very conservative, for phosphorus and one part per million uh, of nitrogen are reasonable expectations, but lower concentrations can be achieved if you want to. Wetlands are among the best ecosystems for long-term carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration by coastal wetlands, blue carbon, has the advantage over the freshwater wetlands of having minimal methane emissions. The fact that wetlands do improve water quality and sequester carbon sustainably does not automatically mean they will be implemented. That's one of the irons in all this. We don't have a lobbying machine for wetlands like we do for agriculture and forestry. If we did, there'd be swamps everywhere. I'd be thrilled. We j it just doesn't have a political machinery. Um, there are large land requirements, and some land managers still fear committing to wetlands for a variety of non-scientific reasons. The government might came and come and take my land away kind of reasons. And then finally, and this is just my mantra at the end of every one of my talk, wetland restoration and creation are not easy. They require attention to Mother Nature, which is what I call self-design. You have to make the system design itself and father time. These projects just take time to reach the potential. So Mother Nature and Father Time are the parents to a very successful wetland system. Uh, if you allow me a moment of self-indulgence, uh, the Wetland 5th Edition is actually listed now on Amazon. And they're giving it a sale for the first two weeks or something. So it's out. Uh, so I said it was basically available on international. I don't think they planned that, but it's actually came out on International Wetland Day. Um, and uh, by the way, that cover I showed it a little earlier, that's a mangrove tidal creek in, on Naples Bay in Florida. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, by the way, the mic is for the camera, not for. You got it. I'll repeat it. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Basically, she's saying the IPCC, the IPCC is, what's the adjective you used? Not controlling, they're driving, they're driving the story of climate change and how do we make an influence to change their general tendency. I don't know. I just know that, and, and sometimes and humorously, I refer to them as IPCC police, but they're, 
but the IPCC is doing an incredible job. They're doing an enormous service to the world, but they're locked into a lot of things. And the wetlands is one that they're locked into. There's just no, and so I'm getting a lot of grief for this paper I just explained to you. It was almost like people didn't want to hear that wetlands are good. And I can't explain that. The mangrove stuff is very interesting too because we're destroying mangroves. Yeah, the mangroves is, and I think they recognize, you know, they recognize that we're destroying wetlands and that shouldn't happen. But I think um, it has hurt wetland protection in my view that methane has been pushed so hard when I don't think it's a, I'm almost ready to write a paper that methane doesn't matter, but I won't. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll paraphrase that. The methane doesn't matter with a little asterisk as long as it's a wetland. Um, but no, it's, it really is true that there's a, a perception that because they create methane, they must be bad for the climate. And at least we shouldn't build any more. I have been told that by some people that used to be called wetland scientists, that we shouldn't build any more wetlands. Let's keep the ones we got, but build, don't build any more. Come on, we need them for all these other issues. There are many ecosystem services that wetlands provide, and that's, that kind of thinking is just doing a big disservice. I don't, how we influence that, I don't know. Is there anybody from IPCC here? <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Now we know there's good methane and bad methane. <laughs> <laughs> we got a question. Many of the wetlands that are easy to create so, so many of the wetlands that are easy to create so will be these uh, type of wetlands and that kind of things that ducks on them are quite fond of producing. And the really have they can produce a lot of biomass, they don't accumulate carbon. So that a lot of the carbon that they are uh, releasing might go off the planet. So comment about Well yeah, they do. That and our you know, we have we have at least ten years of record at our Ohio site where we looked at methane. And there was methane at these created wetlands, but there was also substantial carbon sequestration. So, and, and I argue the carbon sequestration trumps the methane. But they both occur. Anaerobic conditions, fresh water, you're gonna get both. I'm just saying we shouldn't be so alarmed that there's methane if there's substantial carbon sequestration as well. Plus, the wetlands do all those other things, like nitrogen and phosphorus, for example. I'm sorry? A rise in sea level is likely to cause a lot of destruction of existing wetlands. Yeah. Particularly in Florida. <laughs> yeah, and the, man and the mangroves that we just talked about. In fact, one of the footnotes to that study we did, my student did in the uh, mangroves is that we just did a simple calculation of the accretion of sediments versus the sea level rise. And we had seven different sites, okay? Seven different independent sites. Only two of them are going to keep up with sea level rise. So you're absolutely right. Sea level rise. With sea level rise, the wetland has to have, has to be able to move inland. Has to be able to. At least that community. And you get a thing called coastal squeeze, where all of a sudden there's a brick wall or a highway, and that stops it. And that's why we're going to be losing wetlands along our coastlines. It's not because they couldn't move inland, it's because they just bump into something. Okay, so I think in time is up now, so I'd like you to join me in thanking Bill again for his fabulous. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, so we'd also like to give you a token of our appreciation including a local specialty oh. known as bug water. <laughs> Is it, oh, it's a bug water. <laughs> and folks, you have to join me. We've got to drink it tonight because they won't let this on the airplane going back to the U.S. <laughs> it's organic rich, huh? There's a lot of organics in it. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very much.